very good evening and a warm welcome to one and all present here. I am Devolina from Clarnet. Clarnet is India's largest live digital CME and doctors generated medical content platform. So now without taking much time, I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Murali Dhar Kanchi sir, who is the moderator for our today's session. Dr. Murali Dhar Kanchi sir is the director academic at Narayana Health City. Sir is professor and senior consultant, Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care. He is also the principal of Narayana Rujala Institute of Allied Health Science. So now the session is over to you, sir, for the next proceedings. Thank you very much, Devalina, for that kind introduction. I am greatly in, uh, delighted to invite you for this webinar. Thank you for joining the ICA webinar which is a quality uh, academic program. As you know, that Indian College of Anesthesiologists was established in 2008 under the lead, able leadership of uh, Manorama Mittal, Dr. Manorama Mittal, and now currently uh, the leadership is taken over by Dr. R. Uh, B. R. Radhakrishnan, ably supported by Dr. Jayashree Sood, Baljit Singh, Dr. Belani, and uh, to, today we have a very exciting session. Today we have a very exciting uh, topic of coagulation and management. Sometimes we encounter bleeding patients in operating rooms and critical care units and trauma centers and uh, we do everything possible but still patient continues to bleed and it becomes a nightmare to manage such patients. To tackle such problems we have uh, uh, the experts in this field deliberating on the subject and to moderate this session they will also act as panelists we have dr sampadatta gupta dr sampadatta gupta is a very accomplished anesthesiologist having uh, received the president of india award uh, in science congress 2012 and he's one, she's one of the few PhD uh, doctors in anesthesiology. I do not know that a lot of um, anesthesiologists have PhD. She's one of the few PhD holders in subject of anesthesia. And the second moderator panelist is Dr. Anita Shenoy. She's also very well known in the field of anesthesiology. She's a professor at Kasturba Medical College, Manipal. And to the third moderator panelist is Rekha Das. Again, another accomplished person in the field of uh, anesthesiology. And uh, she's extremely talented and very well respected in the academic circles. With these few words, I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Sampadatta Gupta to carry on the proceedings. Dr. Sampadatta Gupta, please. Uh... Uh, very good evening to you all, sir. Uh, I am expressing my deep gratitude to you for calling me here in this August gathering. Yes. Without delay, I want to call upon Dr. Swapnil. I must thank the organizers of this uh, wonderful webinar, uh, which is, I think, a regular uh, educational, educational activity from ICA. So, uh, uh, let me uh, begin with the, my presentation, which is on physiology of coagulation. Now, when we talk about coagulation, you know, it's basically a balance between the two systems, right? So since we have a pressurized vascular system, okay, whenever the vascular system get injured, the blood flows out. Okay. So the first step in any coagulation system is to prevent the further blood loss. And therefore, few factors work in, in, in favor of that, which are known as procoagulant. Well, on the other hand, some other factors maintain the fluidity so that this process of coagulation is not carried away uh, all over the body. And we did not have thrombosis or the thrombi being generated all over the body. So those are called as anticoagulants, which are, which are mainly maintaining the fluidity of the blood. Right. So if we, uh, this, this whole process of coagulation is analogous to uh, a sort of a drama, you know, which is mainly uh, uh, anchored by three heroes and supported by multiple side heroes. 
right? So now, which are the three main heroes of this whole drama? Okay, so we have coagulation proteins, which also are commonly known as clotting factors, which have platelets, which are your primary megakaryocytes, and we have a vascular endothelium. These three are the main propagators of the coagulation or the main initiators of the coagulation system, which then activate a certain other number of factors, which um, uh, eventually uh, lead to a platelet plug formation. So we are going to see step by step how each of these factor contributes, how each of these factor works. So to begin with, uh, whenever there is a vascular injury, the first for the first trauma occurs to the vascular endothelium. Okay, and this vascular endothelium uh, beneath this vascular endothelium are hidden number of factors, you know, which are then exposed to the flowing blood. And these factors include tissue factor and von Willebrand factor. Now these two are the main factors which are uh, involved in the coagulation process. Okay, once we come to the uh, coagulation cascade, we'll we'll come to know how these each of these factors play a role, right? The second uh, 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 fiddle of this uh, coagulation uh, process is are the platelets. Okay, so as soon as the uh, uh, as we all know that you know platelets are sort of floating in the blood, as soon as they come in contact with the uh, von Willebrand factor and the tissue factor, what basically happens is the first step is the adhesion. So these are the platelets adhered to the site of the injury. Then the second step is activation, where the platelets liberate certain number of uh, uh, certain number of proteins and certain number of uh, 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 factors which are expressed on the surface of the proteins, which lead to aggregation of these platelets. And these platelets aggregate together, initiate the coagulation cascade, and that may then that then generates the fibrin, which then forms the platelet plug. Okay, so this is the process of uh, formation of a platelet plug. And the third factors which are important uh, for the coagulation are the coagulation factors. Now we, we know that there are around 13 coagulation factors. Okay, each, uh, uh, one, each one of them has a different name. We know that some of these factors are dependent on vitamin K for their uh, carboxylation. These factors are 2, 7, 9, 10. Uh, uh, so these factors, uh, uh, if there is vitamin K deficiency, these factors will, will not be produced. The primary region where these factors are produced as, is the liver. Okay, but uh, some of these factors are also circulating. For example, calcium fact, calcium, which is factor four, or tissue factor, which is expressed by the endothelium. Okay, so some of these factors are produced by liver. Some of these factors are already present and circulating in the blood. Okay. Now, uh, when we when we look at all these factors, you know the the thing that we need to consider is uh, how long are they going to act? And the factors like factor seven and protein C, these have the very short half life. You know, if you see their half lives, they are roughly around three to six hours. So they have a very short half life. So if they are uh, if they are out of uh, if, the, if there is a liver dysfunction, factor seven is not produced then you may have a, a major derangement of your coagulation system okay now now let's comes to the whole process of coagulation okay now uh, it, it's it's something like uh, uh, something like an orchestra where different uh, uh, musicians have their roles individual roles if any one of them go wrong you know the whole music sort of gets spoiled right so all of them had to work in a synchrony to uh, to achieve the desired effect right Okay, so this is uh, uh, we all know about the cascade model of coagulation, which in which we we used to uh, we used to learn this during our MBBS times that you know uh, factor uh, uh, seven gets activated first, which uh, in when it comes in contact with the tissue factor and that uh, kicks the uh, in extrinsic pathway of the coagulation, whereas the intrinsic pathway is is by the factor twelve which sort of activates factor 11, 9, and then factor 10. And ultimately, there is a common pathway in which factor 10 is converted to uh, factor 10A, which in then in presence of factor 5 converts prothrombin, that is factor 2, to thrombin, and then thrombin converts fibrinogen to fibrin, and that forms ultimately the fibrin mesh. Okay, So this was a, 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 a very common model which was followed and which was understood, which was studied over so many years. Okay, but in 2000, uh, uh, early uh, uh, decade of the 21st century, this model was challenged. Why it wasn't? Why it was challenged? 
because this model couldn't explain a few findings. What are those findings? This model couldn't explain why the bleeding is not seen when there is a deficiency of factor 12. So then, so so if so if there is a deficiency of factor 12, the intrinsic pathway is not going to act. But still, clinically, these patients they don't suffer from bleeding. At the same time, there are few other factors like high molecular weight kininogen or pre calicrin which are also if they are deficient, that doesn't matter. Okay, whereas certain factors like factor 9, factor uh, uh, 8 and factor 7, if they are deficient, that leads to severe bleeding diastasis, which is completely out of proportion, even when your intrinsic pathway is intact. So somewhere this cascade model fails to explain the few findings. And therefore, what is proposed nowadays is a cell based model. Okay, and this cell based model goes through the four phases. The first phase is initiation, followed by amplification, followed by propagation and termination. Now we are going to see each of these phase and what happens in each of these phase individually. So the first stage is the initiation. So what happens whenever the there is an injury to the endothelium, it exposes the subendothelial tissue factor and subendothelial form filament factor to the flowing blood. Now, this form filament factor binds to the glycoproteins which are there on the platelets, which leads to a platelet adhesion. And this is how the platelets adhere to the site of injury. Whereas the tissue factor binds to factor 7, which activates factor 7, which in turn activates factor 9 and 10, and that forms something called as the uh, initial extrinsic complex. Okay, so this this complex generation is the most important step in the uh, in the uh, whole coagulation cascade, right? Now the next step is the amplification. Okay, so we all know that this sort of uh, uh, process of uh, initiation and amplification uh, uh, generates thrombin. Okay. And this thrombin uh, sort of then binds to the uh, uh, glycoproteins which are expressed on the platelet surface, activates a, a series of factors and ultimately leads to a fibrin generation. But this thrombin which is generated by the initiation and the amplification process is in, is in very small amount, is in very small quantity, which is easily inactivated by thrombin inactivators which are circulating in the blood. Therefore. This process needs to get propagated and there, there lies the next step of coagulation which is called as propagation. Okay, now in propagation what happens is factor 8a binds to factor 9a which forms the intrinsic kinase complex. So we knew, so we uh, so we just learned about extrinsic kinase pathway, uh, kinase complex which is mainly a factor 7a, 9, 10 and tissue factor. Now, in addition, there is an intrinsic teenage, uh, a teenage uh, complex, which is mainly made of factor 9A and factor 8A. Okay. And this then stimulates a large amounts of factor 10A. Okay. So this process, this process of generation of intrinsic teenage complex and extrinsic teenage complex are quite important to generate large quantity of factor 10A. Okay. And this then factor 10A in combination of factor 5A produces a prothrombinase complex, which is uh, uh, which then stimulates the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin and fibrinogen to fibrin. Okay, so this this thrombin which is created, which is nothing but factor two, which is created, which is which is activated by prothrombinase complex, then converts fibrin to uh, uh, fibrin uh, to a uh, uh, fibrinogen to fibrin, which is then sort of traps the platelets by GP2B3A receptors and then forms a platelet plug. Okay. So this is the whole process, how the platelet plug is formed. Okay. So this, this particular uh, cell based model uh, explains why the process of uh, coagulation is localized. Why? Because this whole changes, they occur only where the sub endothelial injury has occurred. Okay. So these changes do not occur where the injury is not there. And therefore it, it, uh, it definitely explains, you know, why the, uh, why the, why the thrombosis occurs at the injury site and why not it occurs uh, at all the sites in the body. Okay. Now, so the main crux uh, or the main hero in the, in, in whole of this, of this process is nothing but thrombin, which is nothing but generated from the prothrombin to thrombin. So this is factor two, which is also known as activated factor two, 
which then converts uh, fibrinogen to fibrin and then sort of uh, links the uh, platelets in between and forms the clot. Okay. The next step is also quite equally important. You know, the whenever there is injury occurring, it should not only create thrombi, but it should also be able to dissolve the thrombi once the injury is injury factor or injury uh, threat is away, right? And this is uh, this is basically the termination of coagulation process. This is again sort of process in which the thrombi are dissolved and the fluidity of the blood is maintained. Okay, so this is main the, the main uh, actors in this in this process are three. One is heparin sulfate, which is present again subendothelially, which activates a uh, which which for, which forms a conformational change in the antithrombin, which in turn inactivates factor 2a that is thrombin and factor 10a okay so this heparin sulfate which is present subendothelially inactivates factor 10 uh, factor 10a and 2a in addition the thrombin also binds with the thrombomodulin which induces a conformational change in thrombomodulin which then activates protein c and in presence of protein s Therefore, both of them together, that is activated protein C plus activated protein S inactivates factor 5A, right? So these two, sub these two substances, heparin sulfate plus thrombomodulin inactivates NA as well as 5A. In addition, there is another, another factor which is also called as tissue factor pathway inhibitor, which uh, sort of inactivates the extrinsic kinase complex and therefore all the activated factors which are main, uh, which are uh, very influential in, in forming a clot, they are inactivated. So factor 10A is inactivated, factor 5A is inactivated, in turn it terminates a prothrombinase complex and therefore it, uh, it restores the fluidity of the blood. Okay. Now, the clot that has been formed is formed by the platelet plug plus in which is intermixed with the uh, fibrin mesh and the strength of this clot depends on the calcium concentration because calcium calcium is required for all these processes to happen the ph that is if it is severely acidotic ph then the whole the uh, uh, whole uh, uh, formation of clot is disrupted if the platelets are less in number again you have the problems with the platelet flux where the platelet flux won't be a sort of won't be strong enough it also depends on the fibrin diameter the geometry of the fibrin network and the local thrombin concentration. So all these factors are the basically the determinants of the clot strength. So if you have uh, uh, if you have a deficiency of clotting factors, deficiency of platelets, acidotic conditions, hypocalcemia, that's when the whole process of coagulation is going to get deranged, right? So whenever we have patients with a major sort of blood loss, what we need to ensure is that they should not suffer with all these sort of um, uh, all these sort of scenarios, right? Lastly, the uh, once the fibrin has has been generated, platelet plug has been formed, but the injury is now away. Now there is the very important process of fibrinolysis because otherwise the thrombi would would block the uh, vessel and would block the perfusion of the uh, subsequent organ, right? So this process of fibrinolysis is initiated by two main mechanisms. One is again the endothelium, which generates tissue plasminogen activator, and there are monocytes and macrophages which are involved with the inflammation, which also generate the urokinase uh, plasminogen activator. So this TPA and UPA both activates plasminogen to plasmin, and then this plasmin sort of de degrades the fibrin and uh, forms the fibrin degradation products, which are also known as FDPs, right? So this is how the process of fibrinolysis occurs, where the plasminogen is converted to plasmin, which breaks down the fibrin to FDP. Okay, and this whole process is initiated by TPA and UPA, which are the plasminogen activators. But simultaneously, there is a check on the activities of TPA and UPA. Okay, this is mainly by the plasminogen activator inhibitor. So what 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 we understand is to all the uh, all the factors which are there which are which are procoagulants the body has also created some of the anticoagulant factors okay and it's the balance between the two factors that determines ultimately which way the patient is heading right so this is all the uh, all about the process of uh, coagulation which happens 
Now, obviously, it, it does have a lot of clinical implications whenever these, these factors are deficient, whenever the liver is malfunctioning, whenever there is uh, platelets which are sort of uh, either they are poorly functioning or they are lesser in number, that's when the whole coagulation system goes for a toss and we may encounter a severe bleeding, okay, which may even cause a significant uh, amount of blood loss, okay. Commonly known situations like hemophilia A, hemophilia B, which are there, there mainly because of the deficiency of factor, factor 8, factor 9, hemophilia C because of the deficiency of factor 11. So all these are the autosomal disorders which ultimately uh, uh, ultimately are, uh, uh, are there because of the deficiencies of all these factors, right? Now, one thing you must understand is uh, you don't require all these factors to be present in 100% amount. Okay, roughly even a 30% presence of these factors can uh, maintain a smooth coagulation system. Okay, if this, uh, if the percentage of this percentage uh, uh, presence of this factor goes down below 30%, that's when the clinically the process of coagulation goes for a toss, right? And if the factors are less than 5%, that's when there are severe hemophilias or severe uh, bleeding diastasis. Okay, so again, what we need to understand is even a poorly functioning liver, which is generating some amount of factors can maintain a coagulation system. But when the liver completely fails, that, that's when the, the factors, uh, they are completely, uh, they are less than even 5%. And that's when, you know, you have the major bleeding diastasis. Also the vitamin K, vitamin K is, is required for the carboxylation of the uh, carboxylation which is involved in activation of factor 2, 7, 9, 10. Okay. And this carboxylation is very important process. If the vitamin K is not there, then this carboxylation doesn't happen. And then these platelets or these uh, platelets they have, they don't have the ability to bind to the calcium. And therefore, then the, the process of coagulation gets interrupted, right? So uh, if there is a severe deficiency of vitamin K, either because of obstructive jaundice or because of the nutritional uh, then again, the, co the coagulation process goes for a toss. Okay, uh, the the uh, the treatment for the same would be either a replacement of vitamin K or replacement of the factors. Okay, and nowadays, this many of these factors are recombinantly produced. So, if you have a particular factor deficiency, that can be uh, uh, that patient can be managed with a supplementation of that particular factor. Just that these factors, the recombinant, these uh, recombinant uh, productions of these factors is a costly process. Uh, for example, factor seven, which is also known as a no seven, you know, is 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 uh, is is quite costly. Okay, but it is definitely available, and in a, in a severe bleeding diastasis, we can use these particular factors as well. Okay, so with that, I conclude my uh, talk, and I thanks again all the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, and I'm very happy to receive the questions. Thank you. I think we are having the questions at the end of the uh, presentations. I think so. Yes, 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 yes. It's at the yeah. end of the presentation. So that was a very lucid presentation, Dr. Swapnil. Fascinating topic and orchestra, definitely, indeed. It is an orchestra, isn't it? What happens in the body? Uh, I'm sure the audience was immensely benefited. Lovely lecture. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you, Dr. Murlida, for giving me this opportunity to be part of this webinar. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Alok Samantrai, Professor and uh, Head, Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care, Swims Thirupati. I had the good uh, opportunity to know his predecessor very well, Dr. M. H. Rao. It's a pleasure for me to have met you at least online for now. Uh, Dr. Um, Samantrai, as you can see, is MD, PDCC, PGDDM, uh, even ITC coordinator, American Art Association. Uh, he's going to tell us about blood conservation techniques. Over to you, Dr. Alok Samantrai. Thank you, madam, for kind introduction. And uh, without wasting much time, let me start my topic. Uh, and uh, let us start with uh, what is blood conservation first. Blood conservation is something as defined by the WHO each, which requires a reduction in the allogenic transfusion. Blood preservation is something which looks for alternate to the blood transfusion and also appropriate blood component therapy. All the three components were included under the blood conservation as per the WHO definitions. So how we achieve these things? 
this thing can be achieved in the intraoperative period either by reducing the blood cell loss or by making the patient so much comfortable with the blood cell that during the surgical period he can afford to lose some blood without requiring for a allogenic transfusion. Let us see how we can do that. Among the clinicians, perioperative blood conservation is widely practiced before, during, and after surgery. This is because not only it reduces the allogenic transfusion, but also it results in fewer infection rate, faster recovery, and early discharge. And all these things are one of the component, whatever strategy you try to employ in your hospitals. That is the reason why many clinicians are nowadays favoring a blood conservation protocols in their hospital. Let us see what we can do either before or after or during the surgery. Before surgery, we have three options. Dr. Alok, can you please, uh, uh, slides are not changing. You will have to go for slideshow, I think. Uh, the before surgery, we have three options in which we can conserve the blood. One is either you can go for uh, nutritional supplement along with uh, a specific medication to improve the erythropoiesis that we can do by giving the recombinant derived erythropoietin to stimulate the RBC cell mass. This is appropriate for the patients who come with less than optimal RBC, that means their RBC is somewhere below 11 gram percentage. The second option is something which works just like what is a traditional bank does, that means the patient goes to the blood bank, donate the blood, reserve the blood and whenever he need it, he get the blood. We'll go through this in the next slides in much detail. And the third one is just looking at the different drugs that the patient might be on, which can interfere the patient's hemostasis in the intraoperative periods. The basic problem with all this type of technique in the before surgery period is the patient needs several hospital visits, whether to receive his epoptin or to receive or to donate the blood in the blood bank, the patient need to visit the hospital several times that may not be convenient to each the patients. And the second is all this has a lag time. That means the patient has to wait for his surgery at least for five to 35 days. That means if you are going to change or something, bring something in anticoagulant, antiplatelet medication, then the patient has to wait for five to seven days. And the patient is going for a blood donation, then he has to wait for 21 to 35 days so that the enough amount of blood is collected in the blood bank, which can be used in the intraoperative period. The problem with the recombinant erythropoietin treatment is the patient might have some thromboembolic event in the perioperative period, which is a major concern with this type of therapy. Let us look into the preoperative autologous donation. Here, the, actually what happens is the patient comes to the hospital who has a more than optimal amount of RBC. That means the patient's hemoglobin and hematocrits are in the range of 11 to 12 gram percentage, and the patient do not have any significant cardiovascular and pulmonary comorbidity condition. And the patient has a requirement of transfusion by more than 10 percentage. So here the patient donate his blood once or twice weekly before the actual surgery date. And the last blood that is drawn from the patient is at least three days before the actual scheduled surgery so that the patient gets time for enough time for compensatory erythropoiesis. The very limitations for this preoperative autologous donation is, which is not desirable at all, is many of these patients, they develop postoperative anemia. Because even if the compensatory erythropoiesis takes place, it does not completely compensate for the RBC mass, which is lost in the form of donation. It only support up to 60%. So the patients after donating blood in the perioperative period or immediately postoperative periods, the patient become anemic. And this makes what the patient again needs allogenic blood transfusion. So although preoperative autologous donation reduces the allogenic blood transfusion, completely does not eliminate the requirement of allogenic blood transfusion. Second is this type of patients, usually they blame the hospital if there is some complications while donating the blood because it's the doctor who convinced them to donate the blood before the surgery. Why this thing happens unlike a normal blood donation where a completely healthy patient comes to the donate the blood, these patients are sick in one or two systems. When they donate blood, the risk of complication is 12 times more than the normal donation. The most major problem which is not uh, proves to be very much beneficial is uh, we cannot actually predict 
how much blood the patient need to donate in the preoperative period and what is the actual yeah. demand of the patients in the intraoperative period. So what happens sometimes the patient donate the blood which is not at all required during the intraoperative period. In that point of time, it leads to discarding the blood which is collected because as per the certain rules, we cannot transfuse it as a allergenic transfusion to other patients. And the fourth most important thing which is concerned which is coming is the, this preoperative autologous, autologous donation in cancer patients. It was seen that the cancer patients, if they are donating the, in the preoperative periods, there is an increased chance of cancer recurrence. So these are the few limitations of the preoperative autologous donation. During surgery, we have four things that we can do to preserve the blood. Several status will be there, which will be applied by the both surgical team and anesthesia team. But we will look into these four techniques, which is widely practiced and which are having sound evidence that they helps in preserving the blood. The most commonly practiced is acute normovolumic hemodilution, controlled hypotension, hypotension or permissive hypotensive anesthesia, cell salvage and different pharmacological therapy, which prevents bleeding in the intraoperative periods. Coming first to the acute normovolumic hemodilations, here, this is again a type of autologous blood donation only. But here, what happens is instead of the patient going to the blood bank to donate the blood, the patient donates the blood on the operation theater table. That means either just before anesthesia induction or immediately after anesthesia induction, certain amount of blood depending on the patient's preoperative hematocrit and body general metabolic status is drawn into an anticoagulated bag. And the patient bleeds as usual or with certain conservation technique, the diluted blood. And this blood which was collected in the pre-surgical periods are replaced with a cellular fluid. Usually crystallates will be replaced for the blood which is drawn from the patients. So at the end of the surgery or once the major bleeding ceases, this blood which is collected in the just pre-surgical period is transfused back to the patients in the reverse order. The indication for this type of autologous donation is when the likelihood of blood loss is more than 20% of the estimated blood volume, the patient should have at least a preoperative hemoglobin of at least 12 gram per deciliter without any significant cardiovascular and pulmonary comorbidity and there is absence of infection and risk of bacteremia. The benefit of this, because a certain amount of blood is just removed before the surgery starts, it decreases the viscosity of the blood that helps in a free flow of the blood and it improves the tissue perfusion and thereby oxygen delivery. Second is what we have seen preoperative autologous donations, the clotting factors, all those things, they are no more available when the patient actually uses the blood in the intraoperative period. But here, because the blood is donated in the operation theater itself and getting reused by the patients within eight hours, most of the proteins, blood component, coagulation, no, cross -match, is no, with the patient. no clarity color. So this blood again doesn't require any cross mesh testing and there is limited risk of the clerical error. The only risk associated with this acute normal volume hemodilation is while taking one or two unit blood, there may be sudden decompensation of the patients if patient is not properly evaluated. So there is a sudden hemodynamic changes. So that need to be tackled by appropriate acellular fluid transfusion. The next technique that we can use in the intraoperative period is cell salvage technique. This technique is nothing but uh, collecting the shed blood. That means it does not even allow the surgery to be interfered. That means in the preoperative, this uh, acute normal volume hemodilation before the surgery, the surgeon has to wait for some time till the blood is collected. But here that is also not required. As the surgery go on, there is a bleeding from the surgical site. That blood is collected and need to be processed so that a concentrated amount of RBC can be collected back at the end of the surgery, which can be transfused back to the patients. The advantage of this technique is this can be used not only for elective surgery but also for emergency surgery also the same technique can be used. But only thing is this is not as cost effective as acute normal volumic hemodilution because this requires a special machine to centrifuge the blood and give the actual RBC component. The indications are whenever there is an anticipated loss of more than 1 liter or 20% of the estimated blood volume, there is increased risk factor for bleeding and patients with rare blood groups and antibodies. And I think this is the only type of 
autologous blood donation which is accepted by the Jehovah Witness. The benefit of this cell salvage therapy is it does not involve manipulation of patient's physiology. That means either in ANH or PAD, there is a risk that while at the time of donation, because, but here that risk is not there because it's the normal process, the surgery is going on and the blood is only collected into a separate reservoir. The second is, it is not affected by the cancellation of the surgery. What happens in the preoperative autologous donation, if the surgery is cancelled for some reasons, then most of the blood which is collected, at least the first unit of blood which is collected, it got expired, the lifespan of the blood get expired. So those type of risk is not available in cell salvage technique. The limitation of cell salvage technique is usually it is not indicated or relatively contraindicated in patients with infection and malignancy. But with the use of leukocyte depletion filter, the risk of infection can be reduced up to 99%. But again, in the patient's surgical site, some metal is being used as in the osteo uh, orthopedic surgery and all those things. It cannot distinguish this small metal fragment that also gets sucked into the centrifugation process. So it's always better to use two types of suction catheter. One dirty catheter, which can be used when they are doing this type of uh, suction, when their metal fragment is used. And the rest of the times they can use a clean catheter where the blood will be sucked into the uh, reservoir bio where it, is, it will be centrifuged. Second is the recurrence of cancer risk is minimized in this. That means in cancer patients also, this technique can be used. But only thing is you have to use specialized blood bags, which will be subjected to irradiation to remove all the tumor cells. If this technique is used in the post-operative period, probably there is a risk of uh, coagulation abnormality or risk of kidney failure, because mostly in the post-operative periods, so they use a process where the RBC are not washed and transferred back to the patients. The second limitation is again, this technique will not be cost effective unless at least you are collecting at least one more than two units of blood in the intraoperative period. That is the reason some centers, they do not start the centrifugation process unless at least 700 ml blood is collected in the reservoir bowel. The next technique is induced hypertension, most favored by the anesthesiologist. Here we know that apart from the duration of the surgery, the next thing that can give rise to increased bleeding is the rise in the blood pressure. So here the blood pressure is controlled to a systole blood pressure of around 80 to 90 and a mean arterial pressure of around 60 millimeter of mercury by either giving deep anesthesia and analgesia, but that delay the patient's recovery once the surgery is over. So many people resort to a moderate amount of anesthesia and they use vasoregulatory drugs to bring down the blood pressures and control the heart rate so that the bleeding is minimized. The basic problem with this technique is even with a safe range of hypertension, one cannot uh, completely eliminate the risk of brain damage, stroke, and sometimes even the cardiac heart attack may happen. And the, in part few surgeries where there is a prone position, so there may be a risk of endorgan hypoperfusion resulting in either ischemic optic neuropathy or acute kidney injury. So this technique may not be suitable for a very long surgery, but for moderate type of bleeding and in a specific group of patients without any other cardiac pulmonary comorbidity, this technique will be very much helpful. The other things that can be used during surgery is giving a pharmacotherapy. Either you can use antifibrinolytics like tranexamic acid, absolute amino caprylic acids, calicrine inhibitors like eprotinin, desmopressin, Novos, my previous speaker has told about the Novo7, local anesthesia, vasoconstrictor, all these things in some way reduce the bleeding. Even a misoprostol rectal, where we are considering that um, there will be risk of PPH, also can reduce the bleeding. And uh, just uh, giving local anesthesia and vasoconstrictor before putting a scalp incision also can reduce the bleeding. These are the few general techniques that is widely accepted by all the clinicians, so which in some way reduces the bleeding. May not be a big amount, but still it will be a part of the blood conservation technique, like positioning the patients the surgical part above the heart level reduces the venous pressures, just keeping the abdomen free in the neurosurgical positions reduces the venous pressure and reduces the bleeding. Central neuroaxial blockade by having a better control of the heart rate and blood pressure reduces the bleeding. One degree centigrade decrease in temperature increases the loss of blood up to one unit. So a normal temperature is always desired to as a part of blood conservation strategy. Minimal invasive surgery compared to open surgery is always preferred. Tourniquet, whatever advantage you may get with tourniquet, uh, that may be completely compromised 
if the surgeon asked to open the tourniquet to check his hemostasis before own closures, then that benefit of tourniquet may get compromised. Topical hemostatic agents like it's just a combination of a mechanical uh, collagen or foam or gel foam along with the thrombin agents. These are also helpful to certain extent using of a higher uh, technical bipolar sealing device, harmony scalpel. This also reduces the bleeding to certain extent. After surgery, basically pressure dressings, pharmacotherapy, cell salvage, and point of care testing, they are helpful in preserving the blood. Pressure dressing, we know that this is a, definitely it is a natural way of stopping any sort of bleeding. Pharmacotherapy, same tonics make acids, calicrin inhibitors, all those things may be continued in the post-operative period to have a better control of bleeding. Post-operative period also cell salvage technique can be employed through the whatever blood we get from the through the drain that can be retransfused after washing the RBC to reduce the risk of AKI. Regarding point of care testing, I think my next speaker will tell much more about this, how this point of care testing will be helpful in preserving the blood loss or pro providing appropriate uh, blood products so that bleeding can be uh, stopped. To summarize, every hospital should develop a blood management program for individual surgery. One should always look for a setting for a low transfusion triggers, unlike the older days, transfusion trigger of 10 gram percentage with 30 percent hematocrit. One should go aim for 6 to 7 gram percent as a transfusion triggers, <laughs> unless the patient has other complications. One or two techniques in combination always helpful than a single technique. Pharmacotherapy, acute normal hemo volumic hemodialysis, these are uh, low cost techniques that can be utilized almost for all the cases, elective and emergency cases. Self salvage technique has much promising results if the hospital has appropriate infrastructure for the same. Thank you. And uh, I'm sorry for the disturbance, whatever happened in the middle. And I thanks the ICA for giving me the opportunity. Very comprehensive lecture, Dr. Alok. Um, ex very, very useful points. Thank you so much. Very nice lecture. So I shall be taking over. So shall I? Take over yes, now? yes, doctor. yes. So that was a very nice and comprehensive talk by Dr. Alok Samantrai on blood conservation techniques. I think he has covered practically everything about it during the perioperative period. So now we move over to our next speaker, who is Dr. Pooja Natarajan. She is the consultant uh, cardiac anesthetist from Narayan Vidalia Hospital. And she has a list of qualifications as MD, FNB, FICTA, FICCC, FASC, NB, test and more. Some of which I do not know actually. So, and uh, she is a faculty at the national and the international PE and in the anesthesia conference. She has six publications, international and national to her credit. And her areas of interest are aortic surgery, transplant, VAT and ECMO. With this, we now um, request uh, Dr. Puja to kindly give a talk on viscoelastic techniques, which is a very upcoming subject and we must all get to know how to do it. And uh, we must also try to procure it. Now, Kuja, you can share. She has started sharing her slides. Thank you for the kind yes, intro. Thank you for the kind intro. Thank you, everyone, for giving me an opportunity today to talk on viscoelastic testing. So uh, to keep it short, uh, viscoelastic testing is a point of care coagulation test. And these are bedside monitoring tests which are available, unlike the uh, olden days where uh, we used to send the blood to the laboratory to get the tests done. And it used to take a lot of time. But thank thankfully, we have uh, all these uh, uh, small gadgets which are available next to our OT. And whenever there's a massive transfusion happening and we can give uh, evidence-based uh, algorithm-guided uh, uh, transfusion and specific platelets, fibrinogens can be corrected by knowing how to read a trace. So uh, this was uh, started, uh, described by Hartert almost uh, in uh, uh, 1948, that's quite long ago. And uh, this is uh, very unique because we can uh, visualize the trace uh, live, unlike in the lab where we don't know what's happening. 
Here we can see how the clot is formed, organized strength, and even lysis can be visualized. So it's very fast, it's uh, handy, and whole blood is used. And uh, as I said, it is uh, evidence-based uh, algorithms can be used and uh, anybody can do it. Uh, but uh, uh, again, to talk about the disadvantages, uh, it, uh, we measure the coagulation uh, under artificial uh, conditions in a quet. So it can be a little uh, dicey and uh, a little training and competency, of course, is required. And uh, the rigorous quality assurance, which is done in laboratory, uh, may not be done because it's there in the OT and nobody will come down to, you know, uh, take care of it. And it's uh, quite expensive. So as Dr. Swapnil said, uh, these are the parts. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Thank you. Uh, these are the uh, pieces of coagulation which will be monitored separately. And uh, I will... And uh, as a cardiac anesthesiologist, I am uh, I am very much uh, concerned about the factor one, that's fibrinogen, and uh, the factor seven, and the factor thirty, uh, which is like the forgotten factor. But uh, to uh, remind you all that uh, the cryoprecipitate has a lot of factor uh, thirteen, and which can save us from massive bleeding. So uh, to go to the uh, uh, coagulation pathway, as we know, we can, uh, uh, at, in the rotem, we can look at intrinsic pathway and extrinsic pathway separately. And fibrinogen being in the common pathway, we can separately look into the fibrinogen levels. And then based on the levels, we can, uh, uh, values, we can give uh, cryoprecipitate transfusion and save the day. Uh, to have a background about the patient is very important, especially the history, the drugs patient uh, is on, and the comorbidities like any uh, chronic liver disease or kidney disease makes a lot of difference. And intraoperative factors, uh, me being a cardiac anesthetist, the cardiopulmonary bypass is uh, uh, a machine which actually eats away all the coagulation factors, especially the platelets. So we need to keep in mind uh, particularly about the platelets and the fibrinogen, as, as I mentioned. The redo surgeries and the length of the surgeries is also important because of the temperature, hypothermia, and hyperfibrinolysis. So we'll talk uh, about sunoclot, TEG, and Rotem. Misco uh, will speak this. Yes. So, uh, so let's talk about the sonoclot. So sonoclot uh, is a machine where uh, around 0.4 ml of uh, blood sample only is required. And uh, it contains a Kuwait, uh, which has a glass bead activator and a heparinase. And it has a probe, which uh, vibrates a very high frequency. And uh, 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 say clot, sonoclot signature is formed and we interpret the all the parts of the coagulation pathway uh, based on the sonoclot signature. I shall, I shall come uh, to the details in the subsequent slide. The TEG and the Rotem are almost similar. The only difference we need to know is the uh, in TEG, the, the heated cups are the one which move uh, very fast and the pin is stationary. And this, uh, when the fibrin strands are formed, this is uh, the pin and the torsion wire. It is uh, suspended in the blood and a trace is formed and this is uh, uh, processed into a uh, graph by the data processor and we'll analyze it uh, uh, eventually. And the uh, amount of blood required is really minimal. So uh, coming to the sonoclot signature. So uh, this is how it looks like. So the first phase is the activated clotting time. And the second phase where the clot rate is what we look at. And the time peak, time to peak also is known as the platelet function time. So this is how a normal sonoclot signature looks like. And there are many uh, standard sensitivity and high sensitivity uh, models which are available. Uh, with platelet function and with heparinase, which will help us to differentiate uh, uh, when there is heparin uh, in the patient's blood and also when there is uh, thrombocytopenia. 
So uh, to analyze the sonocloth signature, the first one will be the ACP. So uh, that's the activated clotting time. So based on the activator used, there are different values. And uh, these are the normal values which are available. And clot rate, clot rate is the R1. So that's the primary slope. And this reflects uh, how the fibrin formation from fibrogen happens. And this, this, sorry. And this is the second phase where uh, the fibrin combines with the platelet and the interaction again clot, uh, strengthens the clot. And eventually the downward trend is the clot retraction. And this is again produced because of platelets induced contraction. So uh, we should know the normal value that platelet uh, function, anything between zero to five is normal. Uh, in, the, uh, in this slide, we see that when there is a poor platelet function, there's a slow uptrending curve on the trace. So this is how a poor platelet function trace looks like. Next, coming to the TEG. So as I mentioned previously, the, in the TEG, the cup rotates, which has the blood, and the uh, pin is stationary, and the torsion wire uh, analyzes the TEG recording as the fibrin strand forms. So what's the difference between Rotem and TEG? This is a modified version, obviously, Rotem. And the activators in it are different. So in Rotem, we can look at XTEM, that is extrinsic pathway and intrinsic pathway separately. Now, it this looks scary, but uh, over the period when we work with the machine, it's quite simple. So I'll keep it simple. The TEG is the upward trace, the bold trace, and the downward dotted trace will be the Rotem. It is the same picture. It's just the nomenclature of the uh, of each the tech and the rotem are different like for example the r time is called the cl uh, clotting time in rotem and interim and extrem has separate values so based on these values the k time and the cft that's clot formation time so based on these values we will uh, interpret as to which coagulation parameter is deficient and we will correct accordingly. So the main thing which we'll be looking at is this MA and the MCF, which will talk about the platelets and the fibrinogen. This helps a lot, especially in cardiac surgeries. And we rely on this and also the CT and the CFT when we give heparin. So we compare between the interim and heptem and based on the ratio, we will uh, decide upon giving uh, extra protamine or not. So uh, this is a very simple uh, slide, which will make uh, all the uh, questions you know, easy. So if the trace looks like a champagne flu, then we'll consider it to be low fibrinogen and give cryoprecipitate. If it looks like a test tube, then it could be low platelets and we'll give more platelets. And if it's like a martini glass, then fibrinolysis and we'll think about giving tranexamic acid or aminocapriac acid. And if it's like a wine glass here, then it could be a factor deficiency. Uh, we we'll look at giving uh, FFP and prothrombin complex concentrate. So when I was learning tech, this, this chart I used to have all the time on my mobile. So if the R time is prolonged, we think of, we give FFP. If it's K and alpha angle issues, then we'll give cryoprecipitate. And maximum amplitude, which corresponds to platelet, we will give platelet and desmopressin. Desmopressin is also very helpful and helps in increase of von Willebrand factor deficiency. And uh, lysis time, if that is uh, excess, fibrinolysis is happening, especially on CPB. And we, uh, we uh, completely rely on our tranexamic acid to take care. Again, this, scare, uh, this uh, slide might look scary, because the Rotem gives a lot of uh, uh, values, like the extrinsic pathway, which consists of the XTEM. The FIPTEM uh, tells about uh, the fibrinogen. The APTEM uh, verifying the effects of antifibrinolytic drugs. The INTEM uh, with the intrinsic pathway. HEPTEM with the heparin. 
so um, these are the uh, five things we do we do regularly in addition to that uh, the platelet analysis is very useful especially in patients who are receiving aspirin clopidogrel prasugrel uh, preoperatively and aratum adaptum and traptum comes to our rescue so pre op uh, if the patient is on clopidogrel uh, so then uh, pre op uh, blood uh, evaluation of rotum platelet analysis and based on that whether to take the patient to surgery has uh, saved many lives so i'll go in detail with the platelet functioning monitoring so the platelet functioning mon analyzer 100 which is quite uh, famous and uh, the uniqueness about this is uh, that it is um, it in uh, the function monitors by incorporating high shear conditions to simulate a small vessel injury and measures platelet addition and aggregation and uh, uh, aspirin mediated plat platelet dysfunction which is very common and uh, also the von willebrand disease so these are the gadgets which are available for platelet function monitoring and uh, the tech also has uh, platelet mapping and which can show the effects of aspirin and adp and uh, this is how the tech uh, trays will look like so uh, going to the trays the red line will show the keolin trays the purple line represents the fibrinogen and the green line represents the fibrinogen plus platelets which responds to adp and there's something a uh, very uh, blurred turquoise line which represents the fibrinogen plus platelets which responds to arachidonic acid so uh, we can see that the inhibition due to the adp antagonism is 55.7 percent and due to arachidonic acid inhibition aspirin is 96.2 percent and that's quite severe uh, similarly these are the different traces especially patient on heparin whenever we add heparinase and the R time uh, is much shorter and the MA increases, we know that heparin is there in the blood and we can give agents to reverse it. There are some uh, percentage of inhibition is calculated by this given formula and based on that we will know how much of uh, platelets are inhibited. So these are the bedside uh, point of care coagulometry available. So we can measure the uh, bedside INR uh, PT, APTT, especially on patients on vitamin K antagonists. So how do we manage? How do we apply clinically? Uh, this is what we face uh, uh, in day-to-day -day activity with all these blood products all around. So uh, this Korean Journal of Anesthesia has this algorithm-based uh, uh, guided uh, uh, guide for bleeding management. I think it's very helpful. I cannot cover this in this session. So kindly go through this. And this is how the chart looks like. So all we have to do is uh, look at the various value, put these values in this and look at what is required. So this is how we manage intraoperatively and for separate for uh, uh, pregnancy related bleeding, for trauma, for sepsis, all the algorithms are different and it comes very handy, especially in chaos situations. So what I would like to tell is um, some important points like uh, in uh, when we have a CET interim and a heptem uh, ratio below 1.25, almost uh, the uh, it was not associated with increased postoperative mediastinal bleed because uh, most of the time the residual heparin is what which will cause bleeding uh, post-op. So uh, this, is, this is a very important thing which uh, we look at. And uh, protamine overdose again, because we are thinking it's heparin uh, overdose and we give protamine, that also can be dangerous because that uh, reduces platelet, uh, causes platelet dysfunction. And uh, so we have to be conscious, cautious about that. So what we, uh, they suggest, sorry, what they suggest is a ratio of 1 is to 0.6 to 0.8, unlike the previous uh, notion of 1 is to 1 or 1 is to 1.3. Now it's come to 1 is to 0.6 ratio of heparin to protamine to be more effective. And uh, again, the fibrinogen level, anything below 2 gram, the increased probability of bleeding, and that has correlated well with the rotem values. 
and the CT extem uh, of more than 85 predicts uh, the INR to be more than 1.5. It's it's very uh, good these rotem and and uh, it completely correlates with our lab values. So the evidence to do is given in all the guidelines. So no doubt that these are very helpful. But the pre-op testing, again, as I mentioned, it is very helpful in patients who are taking antiplatelets, uh, but regularly nobody does it. And uh, not to uh, forget about the COVID, where it is a very thrombotic uh, state. And uh, POC has helped in uh, these COVID patients also to uh, help in blood management. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Pooja, for that excellent presentation. And we will take the questions at the end of the all the talks. So please stay back. Yes. And we'll go, go, go to the last uh, talk of the day. And we have uh, Dr. Arupratan Maithi, who is um, uh, the, one of the leading um, anesthesiologists and uh, he is currently stationed in United Kingdom, Newcastle, and he's a promising cardiac anesthesiologist. May I request him to share the slides and give the brief on how he tackles the bleeding patient. The topic is patient is bleeding. What do I do? So, Dr. Haru um, Mati, please, please start this session. Thank you very much for your uh, kind introduction. So, uh, just one second. Uh, can you see my uh, slides here, sir? Yes, we can. We can. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, sir. And uh, thank you very much, ICA, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, the bleeding patient. And uh, I have no conflict of interest. I have used a few trade names in my uh, presentation, and uh, which we use day to day and uh, but i have no biasness there's no disclaimer so before i start my presentation i want to give some facts bleeding at 33 to 37 degrees are mostly due to platelet addition defect but when it comes to less than 33 both platelet defect and coagulation enzyme defect happens ffp it's associated with transfusion associated uh, volume overload and also transfusion associated acute lung injury. Fibrinogen remains the first component to critically remain low after massive hemorrhage. In 18 trials on a very large number of patients, uh, desmopressin only could minimally decrease the preoperative blood loss. And it's a common fact that one unit of PRVC is expected to raise the hemoglobin by one gram. One pool of platelet increases platelet by 25 to 35. FAP at a dose of 10 to 20 ml per kg increases the uh, coagulation factors only by 10%. And if we give five units of single donor cryoprecipitate, it typically gives one gram fibrinogen. So basically to manage or increase the coagulation factors, we need to use a lot of volume of the FFP and fibrinogen. So I have worked in the cardiac anesthesia for last 10 years. And so I'll be uh, giving example of a cardiac patient, how I do that. I have two basic goals. One, once I do any cardiac case, first goal is that to stop the bleeding as soon as possible. Because the more the blood patient loses, he loses more coagulation uh, products and uh, he becomes more coagulopathic. Eventually he will need more volume and uh, surgery becomes uh, delayed, delayed wounding and all these problems comes. Secondly, I try to use as less as blood products like FFP and cryo and platelet. Because firstly, they have their own problems own complications, and secondly, FFP and cryo can cause trally infection and tackle. So how I manage a cardiac case, just giving an example. 
So this is a 75 year old male patient with a fibrosis of lung is posted for urgent aortic valve replacement for infective endocarditis. So as you can understand from the case that uh, he has a fibrosis of lung, uh, so giving much volume can really jeopardize his uh, lung. And uh, at the same time, he's expected to bleed because he's infective endocarditis. So why cardiosurgical patients bleed? These are the few basic points why they bleed. I'm not going into details. But generally speaking, for, for any bleeding, I think the, uh, either you do cardiac surgery or do non-cardiac general surgery, the principle for management of the bleeding, I think, is the same. There may be slight variation, but essentially it will be the same. So if you're anticipating blood loss, how to get yourself prepared? So what I do, uh, I usually put a, put a big bore peripheral line, 14 gauge or a 16 gauge, big uh, introducer seat 10 french of your, of course arterial line we use cell saver in all patients of cardiac surgery and we have pressurized volume infuser and high flow multifuser in theaters and the high flow multifuser can transfuse warm warm fluid or warm blood products 500 ml per minute so in massive bleeding that's a uh, massive gain because you are essentially transfusing warm fluid 500 ml per minute and we use warming cassette for all the patients for giving any fluid so for this case coming to this case so usually i will order a baseline act a fibtem and a platelet function so all these are point of care testing and we we also i also do something called the hep hepcon so HEPCON exactly tells me the arrow, how, how much heparin I should give to achieve a ACT, uh, good for the bypass, so that I, I don't use a very high dose of heparin uh, and the ACT doesn't go very high and cause more bleeding. So this test is really useful. And for this case, I will use a protein infusion preferably. And if someone doesn't want to use a protein, uh, he can use tranexamic acid. So at the end of my talk, if we can leave it about aprotein, uh, I'm happy to do that. So next, uh, surgery is being done. During the rearming for the phase of CBP, I usually routinely, I send a rearming blood for Rotem Sigma. And Rotem Sigma does all the four channels, uh, XTEM, INTEM, HEPTEM, and uh, FIPTEM. And uh, alternatively, be, uh, I'll send a heparin steak and uh, I'll send a platelet function as well and do the same thing like HEPCON for a protamine dose. So the HEPCON not only tells you the uh, heparin dose, it also tells you the protamine dose because excessive protamine has its own significant uh, consequences. And I shall correct any acidosis with bicarbonate during this time. So this is the how the uh, HEPCON gives you value for the protamine. So you can see the heparin was 25,000, the protamine needed is 168 milligrams. So it's quite low and then expected. So you give the exact amount of protamine so you don't uh, overuse the protamine and don't cause factor V inhibition and uh, platelet dysfunction. And uh, this is the uh, fifth uh, reworming rotem I get. And my, uh, my uh, interest is the XTEM uh, A10 and also the FIBTEM because fibrinogen is the first factor which gets critically low in any hemorrhage. So I usually check the FIBTEM A10 and FIBTEM MCF. And based on these two results, I correct the FIBTEM. So my, in any bleeding, my first uh, aim is to correct the fibrinogen and then everything else, why I will say later. So this, this is the platelet function we get, and this is what it looks like. So you can see the, it gives a baseline platelet count of 159, and we do it by collagen aggregation. So it's a 58% uh, aggregation, that means functional. So total functional platelet count is 93. So in this case, you see that the, although the total platelet count is 159, but the functional platelet count is 93. So the 
beauty of this test is that uh, it gives you exact number. So you know exactly how many predators are functional. And so accordingly, you treat that. So Rotem and uh, Rotem also gives you qualitative number, but this gives you quantitative number. So I use both of them. So based on each uh, results, I keep blood products ready. As I said, we or I don't want to use FFP or cryoprecipitate or platelet. We rather use other things which can be give, given more swiftly and uh, more effectively. So I keep things ready, fibrinogen concentrate, uh, uh, prothrombin uh, uh, complex concentrate, which we use the Beriplex, and the platelet if needed be. I do not order FFP at this time. So while first step after coming up, I use the protamine infusion as per the HEPCON value I have shown you, and excess protamine can cause factor V activation, uh, inhibition, and platelet dysfunction, I have discussed. Once I have neutralized the protamine, then first thing is fibrinogen. So I transfuse fibrinogen if ATM of X time is less than 45 and ATM of 50 less than 13. That is the cutoff point where I will transfuse fibrinogen. In that case, usually I give two valves of fibriga, that means two grams of fibrinogen. And if the uh, ATM of 50 is less than 10, then I'll give four grams of fibrinogen. So what we use typically, we use this fibriga and here it uh, comes as a diluent and as a filter because it bubbles a lot uh, and it's difficult to dissolve. So it comes as a filter. So you filter this uh, solution and give it straight away. You can give it straight away. So like uh, any blood product or cryo and it gives one, one gram, the valve contains 50 ml, means one gram. And for to achieve one gram of Fibrinogen, if you give cryo, you have to use five units of cryo. So that's a lot. And so other way, so if you are if you are not wanting to do that way, what you can do, just do the FIPTEM and check the FIPTEM MCF. And this is a formula by which you can calculate the uh, gram of fibrinogen you want to give. So once I have sorted out the fibrinogen, then my next target will be platelet, if I need to give platelet. So again, Rotem tells me x time and fib time. So if the 8 and fib time is more than 13, that means fibrinogen is fine now, but still 8 time x time is low, less than 45, that means patient needs platelet. Now the question is, how much platelet to give? For that, I have got the platelet function test, the numbers. So I get the functional number of the platelet and Accordingly, I decide how many units of platelets have to be given. So if the functional platelet is less than 80, I give a pool of platelet, which increases by 25 to 30,000. That essentially means more than one lakh platelet. If the functional platelet count is less than 60, I use, you, use two pools of platelets, which essentially increase the platelet by 50 to 70,000. So again, more than one lakh. So safe for the patient. So now, very quickly, I have sorted out fibrinogen and platelets. So what next? And this is the platelet function. And then, after protamine, I'll check the INR with, let's say with the uh, Coagu check machine, which is point of care. It takes just one minute to give you the result. I'll check the ionized calcium in the blood gas. I'll correct any acidosis. I'll check the hemoglobin. And I'll continue a protein in infusion till the chest closure, or if I'm not using a protein, I'll repeat the tranexamic acid and I will keep the patient warm. This is very important. So we use this uh, cassette, warm up cassette, uh, through which any it warms the blood or any fluid instantly. Now, after checking the INR, if the INR is more than three, 1.3, and the clotting time in next time is high, and the patient is clinically bleeding, then I treat with the Beriplex. So Beriplex, uh, usually if the INR is 1.3, less than 1.5, I'll typically give 1,000 units of Beriplex, and with more than 1.5, probably I'll give uh, uh, 2,004 Beriplex, which are usually more than, uh, uh, more than needed for any patient. So by 15 minutes, I have, uh, I have given fibrinogen 
if needed a flat light and very flex very flex also comes you have to you need to dilute it in 20 ml and straight away you can give so by 50 to 20 minutes i have corrected all the coagulation factors and in 50 to 20 minutes there is hardly possible that the patient will bleed much and that's why uh patient really bleeds quite less and then, then the question uh, comes when i use the ffp so in spite of giving the uh a very plex if the ct extent is still high and the patient is still bleeding then probably i'll use the ffp because uh, probably other factors are also deficient and if the patient is bleeding loads and i need to give huge volume as coagulation uh, uh, factor then i'll use ffp rarely we use ffp honestly so when to use cryoprecipitate so because i have told you that i use fibriga in all the cases uh, i mean most of the cases of bleeding but when to use cryoprecipitate so i have given four grams of fibriga that should be enough for one patient in spite of that if i see that the a10 of x time is low or a10 of uh, fib time is low or fib time mc is still low that means probably we are dealing with a factor 13 deficiency which is the last stage which causes fibrin monomer to polymerase to fibrin polymer so at this point even after giving four grams of fibrinogen if the patient still bleeding potentially the patient has factor 13 deficiency with a low fibtem mcf or low uh, fibtem a10 then i'll consider giving cryoprecipitate and in extreme cases um, if nothing is working you can use factor 7a but uh, be alert uh, you can give one milligram of factor 7a but uh, it can cause fatal arterial thrombosis and uh, you have to be sure that you have corrected the acidosis and hypothermia before you use factor 7 it's it's a risky drug honestly so when do i transfuse uh prbc transfusion my uh, transfusion trigger is uh, less than 90 of hemoglobin and in in all cases we use the cell saver and so by this in 90 percent of the cardiac surgery we don't use any unit of blood a uh, prbc so with this protocol we don't we need any prbc in more than 90 percent of the patient now coming to the intrafluid so if there is minor to moderate bleeding it can be managed with crystal light we usually prefer the plasma light uh, because heart main so ringer has the lactate so it can increase the lactate so usually we use the plasma light but remember if you are uh, covering the blood loss with the crystal light you have to give it three times than the blood loss and the half life of the any uh, plasma uh, any uh, crystal light it's low it tends to 15 to 30 minutes so it can usually get thought spaced so any, any bleeding more than moderate, we use the colloid. And in all heart and lung transplant patients who need volume, always use 5% human albumin. So another practice, which I don't do, but you can do, that when rewarming on CPB, when you check the clotting time on x time more than 80 seconds and clotting time on hep time, which is more than 240 seconds, then some people transfuse the ffp on pump or even vitamin give vitamin k on pump which potentially reduces the uh, bleeding post bypass when you come up but i don't practice this so what surgeons use here what we have so there are plenty of uh, things surgeons can use but what your surgeons use you have to know this very well and uh, why if, if we have time we can discuss at the end of my talk so we have oxytamp which is basically the cellulose and the fibrillar is nothing but the oxytamp with the multiple layers it comes as seven layers and we have park plot which is a thrombin powder which is also known as cocaine powder in uk it's a very good by closing the chest and we have got flow seal which is a hemostatic matrix uh, with the uh, um thrombin and we have got tcl containing the thrombin and the hemostat and the fibrinogen as well it's acrotinin a bioglue which contains uh, fibrinogen the beauty of the flow seal is that because it contains only thrombin so thrombin can only interact when patient has adequate fibrinogen so once the surgeon is using flow seal 
if the fibrinogen level is low for the patient, it will not work. That's why we need to correct the fibrinogen first before doing anything. The thrombin comes into fibrinogen, clots the, uh, forms clot. And to flow seal to work, we need a flowing blood because the blood flow clumps and then the thrombin interacts with the fibrinogen on the blood and then uh, clot is formed. But the T-seal, for T-seal to work, you need to clamp because it doesn't work on white surface. You have to clamp the vessel, you have to make it dry, then uh, put the T-seal because T-seal has got fibrinogen and thrombin itself within and a protein in, so then it works very well. And uh, it's by glue is the fibrin. So the patient has been done surgery very nicely. This patient has gone into ITU, has done a well on post-op day four, still got a chest drain because patient's pacing were was still in. So on day four, patient pacing were has been taken out and all of a sudden you got a call that patient is very restless, patient is hypotensive, cold and coming and he has drained one liter, dumped one liter in the drain. So what to do? So it looks like there's a massive hemorrhage after removal of the pacing were. So call for help. The first thing we'll do, the call for help and activate massive transfusion protocol. So what, what uh, are there in the massive transfusion protocol? That means uh, immediately you get uh, O negative blood, four units, and also get four FFP and uh, platelets. And so you activate that. And preferably you need two persons, two specialist person, doctors, and one will assess the bleeding of the patient, whether it's a major or minor bleeding, consult or revealed, anemia, tachycardic, 3D pulse, hypotension, CNS, altered sensorium in shock, skin, cold, cami, urine, not everything. And because the patient is day four, apart from the peripheral line, all the lines have been taken out. So that's another problem, but you treat this, treat this patient. So while other person is prepared to treat the patient, what you do, you would attach the basic monitoring and temperature provision must, and put a large bore peripheral line, sometimes difficult with a, a collapsed vein. So if the veins have collapsed, you can use ultrasound to guide your peripheral line, or alternatively, you have to put an ultrasound guided CBP or a big introducer seat like eight French or 10 French. And uh, very much near, I mean, it, it may be possible that you have to use ultrasound to put your arterial line because artery may be uh, collapsed. And uh, immediately arrange the rapid infusion system with the warm infuser, arrange cell saver, and send a point of coagulation and a blood gas immediately. So this is how we manage the patient and uh, volume and everything. So now, how much hypovolemia and how much fluid to give? That's the question. So how do you assess that then? So once you have done everything, you have intubated the patient, you can see the blood pressure is really low. You have also inserted the PA catheter because patient had a lung fibrosis. You don't know how much fluid you can give at one time, even not flooding the lungs. So uh, upon doing all these things, you see that the periodostolic pressure, which is kind of uh, LA pressure, is very low. So you can safely give the fluid based on the uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. We accept around 12 of uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. You can give fluid, fluid, and blood, whatever. So you're safely, you're not causing any pulmonary edema. And make sure the temperature of the patient is all right. And, uh, and uh, once you do that, other person will probably do an uh, uh, echocardiography for this patient, transthoracic echo. So you can see the heart is floating. So there's a lot of effusion around the heart and you can see big floral effusion um, also can seen. And the though patient has dumped one liter, so still a uh, lot of blood up there inside the heart and the uh, pleura. And uh, he, also don't forget to check the pleura. You can see the collapsed line with a big effusion and in the right side also can see some degree of role effusion is there. So once you do the echo, if you're doing the TOE, if you see the uh, LV, it's collapsed, the papillary muscles are kissing, and you have a uh, very low endostolic area of the LV, then that means the patient is hypervolemic. And also you can use superior vena cava collapsibility index, which is, a, which is a formula. If that is more than 36%, that patient is volume responsive. So as you keep giving the fluid, you have to assess 
at what up to what time patient will be fluid responsive. So SVC collapsibility, which is uh, measured at SVC maximum diameter minus SVC minimum diameter by SVC maximum diameter into 100. If that is more than 36%, that means patient is fluid responsive. Alternatively, in spontaneously breathing patient, you can do IVC distensibility index, which is nothing but IVC maximum diameter minus IVC minimum diameter by IVC minimum diameter into 100. If that is more than 18%, that means patient is fluid responsive. Alternatively, if like see this patient, so this patient to maintain the blood pressure, a um, lot of vasopressors have been used and you have, you still don't know how to manage this patient. So you have inserted the PICO at the last resort. So for the PICO side, GDI, which is the global end volume index and ITBI, intrathoracic blood volume index, which is the marker of preload. So these are very low. That means patient needs fluid. At the same time, cardiac index is 1.7. That means cardiac output is low due to low fluid and SBRI is very high. Anything between 1440 to 1660 is the normal cutoff of SBRI is 4,200. That probably was squeezing the patient too hard with NORAD and vasopressin or whatever to maintain the blood pressure. So what you should immediately do give fluid, give fluid, give fluid, and reduce the norat and vasopressor. So the end result after some time giving fluid, you see the GDI has improved and uh, more than 13% and ITBI has also improved. The normal value of G GDI is something uh, like uh, 660 to 800 and normal value of ITBI is 850 to 1000. So it's still quite low, but the, you see the cardiac output is improving and uh, SBRI is decreasing as you are reducing your uh, vasopressor. And other thing, but very important for this patient, lung fibrosis, you have got the lung water. So this is ELWI, extrathoracic lung water index, which is normal value is four to seven percent. And PVPI, pulmonary vascular permeability index, normal value is one to three percent. So if you exceed 3% of PVPI, that means you are flooding the lungs. That means you are causing pulmonary edema. And uh, so if these are greens, if these numbers are fine, just give volume, no worry, whether it's a pulmonary fibrosis or whatever, give volume, improve your cardiac output, reduce your SBRI and patient will be fine. So that's it. Thank you very much for kind listening. Thank you. Thank you, Arup, uh, for that excellent uh, presentation of how to manage a bleeding patient. You also touched upon the echocardiographic evaluation and uh, uh, taking help of the hemodynamic parameters, how to sort out the bleeding patient. Thank you so much. And we now go on to the um, question answers and panel discussion in the next 20 minutes. I think we'll finish that. May I request all the panelists and moderators to be um, online with videos on, please. So there are a few questions on the chat box. What I'll do is I alternate the panelists' uh, question uh, with the chat box question. So we will co cover both of them. To start with, I'll uh, request Dr. Sampadatta Gupta to tell us uh, if uh, they use in their center any risk scoring techniques for estimation or prediction of bleeding in a given patient undergoing major surgery, be it cardiac or non-cardiac. Is okay. Dr. Sampadatta Gupta? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, actually, uh, 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 for predicting the post-operative bleeding, it yes, is very yes. much essential to understand the complex array of the hemostatic insult that occur as a result of surgery or extracorporeal circulation for individual patient before selecting an appropriate coagulation or hemostatic monitor for the surgery. In my setup, we start the assessment from the OPD department. It is because that patients are taking very much uh, very types of medication, especially 
they are we're taking the antiplatelet anticoagulants or the complementary medicine so if if it is positive then we have to manage as per evidence based guideline now the bleeding history is very much important which is to be taken out including the personal history of bleeding or excessive bleeding family history of bleeding which is very much important for the pediatric patients and the comorbidities which increase the bleeding risk like the bone marrow disease renal or liver disease if it is positive then we have to use the bleeding assessment tool or refer to the appropriate specialist if negative then we do the routine coagulation test like ptt aptt inr act and optimize for admission after admission it is done usually before 3 days we start point of care coagulation testing which include the act pt aptt for functional measurement and take or sonoclot for viscoelastic measurement of coagulation uh, we don't follow any stick uh, or stick to any scoring system what we use we use the sonoclot right. dac or act on the first day and we do the serial monitoring we have the sonoclot uh, accuracy near about 70 to 74 percent at the take 80 to 85 percent to predict the post op bleeding after cardiac surgery and uh, it's to mention that there is no comparison of the take with the sonoclot is uh, it is uh, likely to reveal that the significant uh, uh, no advantage of one over another as both measure the dynamic elastic of uh, the uh, of the homeostasis so this is done in our, my center we could not stick to any risk scoring system for the post operative bleeding assessment thank you thank you dr sampadatta gupta for yes, that uh, um uh, uh, highlighting the, the the technique you use in your center anybody would yes, like sir. to answer uh, i mean add any points to this the panelists or the speakers anybody wants to add any point to this Yes, sir. Uh, Pooja. Yes, sir. please go. Yes, Can we have the videos on, please? Remove this advertisement. Yes, I want to see the speakers live on this screen. Uh, please carry on. Yes, sir. So, uh, uh, just to mention about two, three uh, scenarios in cardiac, especially when we come across one right. is uh, when there is a bicuspid aortic valve. so because uh, any congenital defect of the aortic valve because of the sheer stress of the blood yeah. movement across the valve we have observed that uh, the factor uh, fibrinogen is very low so in our center uh, routinely pre op we do uh, baseline fibrinogen levels and based on that we will assess the fibrinogen eventually with the rotem if there is massive bleeding and we will give cryoprecipitates that's one point and uh, second thing i would like to mention is about uh, lv uh, any vag that's ventricular assist device yeah. uh, whenever that is placed in the body uh, what happens is the blood is continuously moving in and out of it so we have a, a, a von willebrand factor deficiency which is very common in that and patients also have uh, bleeding because of these uh, arteriovenous malformations in the gi system because of the vag vad itself so we have to keep that in mind and when we are doing such surgeries especially uh, vad surgeries in non cardiac uh, with uh, non cardiac cases then uh, uh, we have to have a baseline value so that we can work on it if there is a bleeding so this is what i would like to uh, to highlight thank you thank you for your comments uh, um Arup, what do you have any scoring system for these patients? Do you follow anything like that? Uh, no, sir. It's uh, we don't follow any scoring system. It's, right, 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 uh, right. Because so many factors involved. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, actually, but, this is ineffective. Yes. Right. And if, if you but uh, if you think like patient may bleed and uh, we have restriction for giving lot of fluid to the patient, then probably we uh, take more more care of that and. Uh, we don't routinely do the fibrinogen level for any patient but if we suspect anything we do the fibrinogen with a close fibrinogen because the total fibrinogen level it doesn't guide you a lot honestly so close fibrinogen is the functional fibrinogen which is the actual number 
So if that right. is all right, then you can be guided by that. Actually, so, actually, yes, yes, sure. yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, Arup. Uh, can I have the faculty seen on the screen, please? Anybody from the logistics? I would like to see the faculty on the screen. The question from the chat box is uh, leukocyte reduction reduces uh, CMV, but not really helpful in prevention of infection. Anybody would like to take the question? Any of the speakers or the panelists? Yes, sir. The leukocyte reduction filters, uh, if the size yes. is less than 40 microns, uh, maybe technically this English, it reduces the transmission of the infection. That is the reason why we are using a leukocyte reduction filter in patients who are already having infections. So that is the cause of how it prevents the infection also, because it reduces the transmission. Definitely it helps in preventing the infection. Uh, anybody else who wants to add any point on this? Actually, leukocyte reduction is in preventing some of the adverse uh, reactions such as fibrin re reaction. And also it reduces the HLA and uh, platelet ant antigen uh, immunization and reduces the risk of uh, CMV infections. And there is evidence in the literature to show that uh, it, the bacterial proliferation also may be prevented by leukocyte reduction. Now we'll go on to the second panel question that is uh, directed towards Dr. Anita Shinoy. Do you use any blood conservation techniques in your center? If yes, what is the technique you use and in which uh, conditions do you use it? Um, blood conservation techniques, I think uh, in earlier days, we used to use for major surgery such as scoliosis. We used to use what is called acute normovolemic hemodilution and right. induced hypotension. They have gone out of uh, date now, so we don't use uh, hemodilution anymore. Hypotension, induced hypotension, we are not that um, uh, aggressive now uh, because of the worries of hypotension and its own problems. So I think it's more of prevention uh, that ha uh, helps. Tranexamic acid is a very uh, popular drug now. And so that is being given for uh, all surgeries where we expect large blood loss. I'm talking in terms of all non-cardiac surgeries only. Yeah. Yes, yes uh, that is fine. That is fine. Yeah, you can, yeah, yes. Yeah. So better surgical techniques and things like, you know, day-to-day uh, -day things, avoid hypertension, avoid hy hypercardia, avoid hypothermia, avoid uh, hemodilution in terms of uh, you know, liberal fluid therapy. Those kind of things are given much more attention. And, they have, and of course, our uh, uh, trigger for transfusion also has lowered now. So we don't pick up uh, blood bags as easily as we used to do earlier. So that has definitely reduced the transfusion rates. Uh, we don't really use cell saver. Um, probably because our patients don't bleed that much, not that kind of surgery that happens. That's why. Yes, sir. Attention to positioning of the patient, you know, so basic uh, techniques. That's what we use. The surgical techniques are also a lot better now with the cautery and the harmonics and hemostats that they also use, as was mentioned. Yes, sir. So we can't hear you, you're muted. Can I have the faculty members seen on the screen? I want to see them face to face. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. I got it, I got it. Thank you. Uh, the other, the next question is from the chat box. Uh, can we have the chest cavity packed? Uh, or the media stain impact, and then uh, so, uh, sort of the bleeding, bleeding uh, problems at a later time. Is that a good technique? Any of the panelists or the speakers can take the questions. Yes, sir. It's uh, the same thing what is covered in the post-operative period. A pressure dressing sometimes helps. If right. The, if it's a generalized oozing, sometimes the pressure dressing helps. But if it's a 
patient is bleeding surgically then also the pressure and shifting to the ot and looking for exact bleeding vessels and uh, tying it up definitely helps it uh, get covered under the pressure dressing in the post operative period yes 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 that's very Anybody? common for liver injury and splenic major laparotomy that's very common to uh, yes, yes. packing and coming back relook later about when yeah. 24 to 48 hours later very we, we do the same for cardiac surgery the patient is oozing and we are not able to tackle on the site we pack the chest and then uh, get the patient back the next day and uh, invariably invariably the bleeding would have subsided by that time do you agree with that pooja and other participants yes, aru yes 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 sir uh, uh, it has to be uh, based on uh, rotem we have rotem in, in our institute if the rotem is normal and our post op all our uh, coagulation parameters are normal and definitely the packing will help but if those are abnormal and still we are looking at packing i think within an hour we will shift the patient back It okay, okay. let me turn the question a little bit. Did you have any situation where all the parameters were normal, but the patient was still bleeding? Yes, yes, many a time, sir. Yes, yes, yes. It does happen. Now I'll go on to the next panel question that is the directed towards Dr. Rekha Das. Uh, in a non-cardiac surgery setting, how do you manage intraoperative bleeding, which is uncontrollable? Do you follow any algorithms for that? In an arm cardiac surgery, yes. for example, you have yes, a when the yes, sir. Yes, yes. So, if, so this is for a massive blood transfusion. I think we are talking about when we are having a uncontrollable bleeding yes, or a yes. significant bleeding. Okay. Yes. Having said about the side effects of transfusion, definitely in a massive, uh, you need to have a massive transfusion protocol in this situation. Right. But the general formula is to transfuse. Uh, RBC with uh, FFP and platelet in the ratio of one is to one is to one, as, uh, uh, as said by Arup, which also uh, extrapolates to non-cardiac surgery also, uh, where we give four units and then we equally uh, give an equal volume of uh, fresh frozen plasma and platelet. Right. But uh, it would be prudent to go for an intensive monitoring in these situations because um, uh, because we also understand that some of our patients are comorbid. And uh, some of some of them may not tolerate the anemia to a great extent, and we have to also look at the ongoing blood loss that is taking place. And so we need to do an intensive monitoring of these patients by looking at the making a visual assessment of the surgical feed and the standard assessment uh, methods for quantitative measurements, like looking at the uh, surgical sponges that have been used up, the blood that is in the suction canister and in the right. drains. Okay, and then we need to also. When we are transfusing, we also need to look at the perfusion of the vital organs, like the urine output, which are the most basic, the vitals like the blood pressure, mean arterial pressure of 65 we need to maintain. And the heart rate also, we should see that if the patient is tachycardic, even if the volume appears okay, then probably we have not replenished adequately the pulse volume and the peripheral oxygen saturation. We also need to do some point of care testing like a blood gas analysis which will not only tell you about the hemoglobin that the patient can tolerate, maybe 7 to 9 gram, but also what is the partial pressure of oxygen there in it and the pH, which is very important, which will right. tell you about the oxygen extraction Absolutely. that is taking place. Okay, yes. If the pH is seven less than 7.2, it is very important that probably what we have done, the replenishment is not enough, the anemia is not really corrected. And also, if it is possible, we can go for a mixed venous oxygen saturation. And uh, as the pointed out again by Dr. Arup, that if you have a facility for a intraoperative echocardiography, then we have a really a blessing in us with us. Like we are the opportunity to do that and we can do again. That is also a point of care testing when we know how much to transfuse and how much of hypovolemia the patient is having. So having done all this now, sir, you were talking about the algorithm. Well, then that... Um, calls upon the algorithm approach is actually a goal-directed therapy, which is based on the viscoelastic method, which has already been pointed out by right, right, and, right. Uh, and nothing, uh, and uh, to highlight this, we have, we need to have a rotem facility, which we really do not, in our institute, we do not have a rotem facility, but nonetheless, uh, whenever a patient is bleeding, uh, for a pe for people, this is for people who do not have a rotem facility, I would like to highlight, you should first consider hyperfibrinolysis in this kind of situation. And right. it is better to treat them with tranexamic acid with a dose of 20 to 25 milligram per kg body. And then 
if the patient is still bleeding, we can consider fibrinogen deficiency. And if we have uh, access to fibrinogen, we should give this patient at this time fibrinogen concentrate at the rate of maybe in a dose of 30 to 60 milligram per kg body. And then third thing we need to consider here is a thrombocytopenia which the patient could be having. And if we have a access to a platelet count being done, that's in a very close by laboratory, which many in our setup, we are having a one inside the OT itself near the OT adjacent to the OT where they do an instant count right. and the qualitative and the quantitative as assessment they also do. And if the quality is good and the count is uh, or less than 50 or something, or in a neuro neurosurgical procedure, if it is less than one lakh, then we would go for a platelet concentrate and one pool, and then again reassess, and then we can go for a second pool. And then after all that, if the patient is still going on bleeding and that is a loss beyond 1.5 liters still continuing, then we can think of other coagulation factor that is a thrombin deficit. And if we have access, we do not have access for this, but if we have an access, we should go for a prothrombin complex concentrate. And that comes in a dose of 20 to 30 international units per kg. But if we do not have, so we have a poor man uh, choice. So it is a fresh frozen plasma in a dose as high as 30 milligram uh, ml per kg. And then after having done all this, if you still consider that there is a need for transfusion, we are losing out on something and the patient is still bleeding. And then we can think of the fifth factor that is the factor 13 deficit and uh, which indicates that probably the patient has clotted, but there is an instability in the clot. That is the fibrin monomer is not going into a mesh. It is not forming a mesh. It is, and so there is, it is not uh, related to hyper, hyperfibrinolysis, but there is a, this is probably occurring in a diffuse blood loss where there is a clot instability. And there you need to give factor 13 concentrate. And again, if we do not have factor 13 concentrate, which we do not have in our center, we go for a FFP. So that is the uh, layman algorithm that we follow in our center. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, maybe you, you must, uh, uh, maybe we should think of writing this up in a resource limited environment, how to manage bleeding. Maybe yes. uh, we should uh, write it up, which may be beneficial to some of the our thank brethren you. in the country who will work in limited uh, resources thank you for that input and we really appreciate the way you manage the patients uh, uh, the, regarding... one thing to that uh, so yes yes, 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 yes what dr rick uh, dr das has told so uh, you can check the calcium calcium is also very important yes for yes uh, i forgot that in yeah, addition absolutely. to all this, we need to look at a few more things that hypothermia, we need to look at the acidosis and we need to look at the hypo hypocalcemia that the patient right. could be having. Right. And anemia, of course, is an issue. Right. Yeah. Right. I right. forgot. Thank you. Thank you for that additional point. Uh, Arup, I would like to make one comment yeah. and ask one question to you. Hmm. The comment is that uh, you put all the facts when you started the lecture, you were saying the facts. What are the facts? One more fact is that bleeding occurs from cut blood vessels. <laughs> bleeding occurs from cut blood vessels. Otherwise, it does not happen. Mm -hmm. So the surgeon is the culprit. He cut the blood vessels and yes. that's why. Uh, this, uh, I mean, in the light of day. But my question to you, you is... Uh, you mentioned a protein in, in your presentation um, over a couple of times. In Europe and in your center, do you use a protein in even now? Uh, I mean, uh, do you, are you using it because it has a red label and uh, we have stopped using for the last 10, 15 years? So, uh, thank you for the please, questions. Please don't put this uh, advertisement. I want to see the face of the faculty, please. After the talk is over, you can put it. Yes. Thank you for the question. So it's a very interesting question. So the red label or black label was put by FDA, which is the American Drug Association, which does not, uh, and the UK and Europe doesn't fall under that FDA. Right. So right. in Europe, it's still very much predominantly, um, aphrodin is still predominantly used particularly in transplants, lung transplants, heart transplant, liver transplant, infective endocarditis. Oh. And, 
and interestingly we had a study let's say and and not not the trial trial i think the results will come soon they studied with uh, multi centers with the europe and they have found the risk is really low so i think in couple of years a protein is coming uh, is making a strong comeback and it's an excellent drug i mean if you use a protein in it reduces the uh, blood loss really significantly and uh, i think in india if you have a protein in you can use because you are not under fda and uh, yes. it's a fantastic drug and the only thing is that uh, so you need to give a test dose uh, for using this a protein in and uh, which we give a bolus of 2 lakh unit uh, sorry it, uh, yeah uh, 50000 into 2 lakhs unit a bolus followed by 50000 unit for our infusion till you close the chest or till you are nearly at the end of surgery so that's it no post operative nothing that uh, that is a protein in but uh, it, i think it's a very very potent drug to reduce bleeding in high risk patients thank you thank you for that and there are two more questions before we wind up for the day i'll just quickly go through that uh, what is the role of fresh whole blood do you use uh, in acute bleeding patients any any of the panelists or the speakers can answer this question uh, do you use fresh whole blood yes. for acute bleeding fresh, bleed sir, fresh whole blood has a role in uh, trauma right it has a role warm fresh whole blood has a very good role as a definite role in trauma settings yeah 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 i always argue with my colleague saying that we should be use fresh whole blood because when my patient is bleeding he's not only uh, losing the rpcs wbcs but also is losing all the factors contained in the blood why not you give everything together in the fresh whole blood rather, rather than give one factor at a time i always argue with him and i i always tend to lose the argument because they have some great ideas about the usage of uh, factors separately and treating the coagulation problem in a particular patient in a particular way so the next question is um, what are the criteria for the use of um, prothrombin concentrates somebody who, i don't know the name of the person has uh, put it what are the criteria for the use of prothrombin concentrate anyone can answer that speakers or panelists yeah so uh, prothrombin concentrate mostly you know contains 2 7 9 10 c and s so right. basically uh, you can use it pre op if the patient is on uh, hypo uh, warfarin for warfarin reversal and also reversal of the some drugs like dabigatran and apixaban all these drugs which increases the inr and uh, in trop we use it deciding upon the inr and uh, clotting time of the extent so if the inr is in cardiac surgery i, I correct it anything more than 1.3 but you can anything more than 1.5 with a clotting time more than 80 second then pcc is a very good choice to correct the coagulopathy thank you arup i think i'll ask the last question to dr swapnil what is the role of factor 7 do you use it in your clinical practice um so factor 7 uh, is uh, is 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 definitely available at our center right. uh, the thing is the prohibitive uh, this thing is this cost is almost like almost 1.5 lakh if i'm not wrong for for a single dose Right. so i remember using it in couple of patients where who were sort of had a blood loss excess of uh, 30 liters um, in a cancer surgeries and uh, these patients were packed post uh, uh, during the surgery and uh, uh, post operatively we were monitoring the intra abdominal pressures and uh, on second day uh, uh, we uh, administered factor 7 It, de- it definitely helped uh, the patient uh, a couple of days later we could remove the packs easily um so uh, not a vast experience but uh, we have used it in couple of cases thank you thank you thank you sapnil for joining us and i think it's time to wind up because it's uh, dinner time now and uh, may i request uh, dr sanil or dr radhakrishnan to say a few vote of thanks and uh, dr sanil is available radhakrishnan is available i don't know 
डॉक्टर राधा कृष्ण बलजीत सिंह जय श्री वन ऑफ यू कैन से वोट ऑफ थैंक्स प्लीज we had a lovely well, session actually we went through the uh, radhakrishna sorry the physiology of coagulation conservation techniques uh, we went through blood conservation then how to test the coagulation problems intraoperatively by using viscoelastic yeah. test and how to manage the patient who is bleeding all the topics were uh, uh, covered in a very efficient manner thank you so much for joining us uh dr radhakrishnan is available yeah yeah i am available thank you sir thank you i request you to yeah. provide the vote of thanks thank Say you some remarks thank you murali and the team this is a wonderful webinar you were thank able you. to really expose the subjects and is equally useful to all i mean practitioners yeah. students as well as we faculty members it is a really good webinar probably one of the best we had in the recent times next we will be meeting the same time and we will be talking on thoracic anesthesia especially non thoracic anesthesia certain parts of thoracic surgery and anesthesia especially on the double domain do basic study and the current use and basically we are going to deal on the optimization the pharmacology and the physiological optimization before surgery right. anyway, that is that is planned for the next week and i really appreciate everybody and i thank all the faculty members in joining this particular webinar as well as all the persons who attended the webinar thank you good night thank you thank you, thank you so thank much you, thank you to everybody good night everyone thank you thank you baljit thank you for joining us thank okay. you so much i was there all through thank you sir